Today's text comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 6 through 12. 2 Kings chapter 2. In your pew Bible, it is on page 290. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you ask me, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not be. They continued walking and talking a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, when they, but when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Sometimes I get a little tongue-tied between Elijah and Elisha and as they continue to go back and forth in the text, so I apologize. But this text is, a, is an interesting text, isn't it? It's a text that is um, very important, very supernatural, very spiritual, very human, very a lot of things at the same time. Elijah, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Elijah was one of, is one of the most important prophets in the Old Testament. But yet, he only appeared in 1 Kings chapter 17. And here we are in 2 Kings chapter 2, and he's leaving us already. All in all, Elijah, the great prophet, was around for eight chapters of the Old Testament. Yet he, his impact is still felt even to this day. That tells us a lot, right? It doesn't, we don't have to be in someone's life or we don't have to change the whole world for our impact to be felt. We don't have to be around for dozens and dozens of years in order for our impact to be felt. Here was Elijah, one of the most important prophets, being taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. Here was Elijah who brought down fire from the sky here was Elijah, who was standing before the Lord. Here was Elijah, who brought to life the widow's son. Here was Elijah, the prophet. And all he is, all of his story is within eight chapters of the Old Testament. But here we also see that there's a relationship that has been built. There's a relationship between him, Elijah, and his protege. His mentee, he was the mentor to the prophet that was to come, Elisha. And here you see that there is this dynamic between them. A dynamic that Elisha doesn't necessarily want to see his mentor leave him. But at some point in all of our lives, when we have mentors, there are times when it's time to cut the cord. Sometimes they're taken from us and go on to be with the Lord. Sometimes the relationship changes. Sometimes distance causes it. But there are times when those who have been at the forefront of our lives are encouraged. And it's necessary for the relationship to change. Elijah was dealing with an Israel who was struggling to believe in God. There's a question that comes up in the first chapter of Kings of 2 Kings where he's asked, is there no God in Israel? 
Because something happens to the king and he's hurt. And the first thing they do is say, go and talk to the prophets of Baal and see if he will survive. Instead of going to the prophet of their own God, they go to another God. Instead of going to Elijah, the prophet of Yahweh, the prophet of their God, capital G. Instead, they are worshiping a little God, a little G God in Baal. A golden calf that was made by hands. A golden calf that does nothing but stand there. As opposed to the living God who created all things with the words, with his voice. They would rather believe or they were struggling to believe in the God who created. And they were willing to believe in a God who was created by people. But it's his time to go. For some, you might look at the story and say, there's still so much work that needs to be done. The people didn't repent. The, the nation was still struggling. Many people, including the kings, were still worshiping the wrong God. But yet, it was Elijah's time to go. But he wasn't leaving and leaving them alone. He was leaving them with a new prophet. He was leaving them with the next generation. He was leaving them with Elisha, who was going to fulfill and continue to fulfill the steps of Elijah. It's difficult because we feel oftentimes that we have to do all the work. It's difficult because we feel that we have to engage continuously. We feel that if this person is not there, then nothing can get done. We feel that because of these people, everything gets done, but we can't do it. It's a difficult situation, a difficult moment, especially when we are still struggling, when we are still trying to piece things together. But yet here we see that even though Elijah started as the prophet and he brought fire down and he started the process of bringing the people of Israel back, to their God, Yahweh, God with a capital G, the creator of all things. Though they were moving in the right direction, there was still a long, long way to go. But Elijah was still taken. The Lord still took Elijah because he knew that Elijah's time had come, but that the work was still to be done. So the mentor now passes the mantle, in this case literally passes the mantle, to the mentee, to Elisha. And Elisha's only request is that he get a double portion of the spirit that Elijah had. In terms of how this sounds in biblical terms, the firstborn son always received two-thirds of his father's inheritance. So in a sense, he's asking for the firstborn son's inheritance. And this may sound familiar because when we remember the prodigal son story, he asked for his portion, which was a third. His brother got two thirds and he got a third. Here, Elisha is asking for a double portion because he knew that he wasn't Elijah and he wasn't going to try to be Elijah, but there was work that needed to be done so he needed to be inspired, and he needed to inspire. So Elisha prays and asks that he can get a double portion. And Elijah says, if you see me being taken, then your, your wish has been granted. And indeed, they were walking along together when the chariot of fire comes and takes Elijah, and Elisha sees. All this in just these few verses. So much is going on. So much is happening. We have the beginnings of what the prophet Elijah did. He brought fire. He brought God back to the people's um, thoughts. He brought God back into their assembly, which they had forgotten. When I think about this and when I think about the relationship between Elijah and God and Elijah and Elisha, I think about our relationships with all of the people around us and all of the things in our life. How many of us have created these gods, 
with a little g. See, it's, it's always, if we were to create a big cow, a golden calf, and worship it, at least everyone would see it. And everyone would know that we are worshiping this golden calf. But for many of us, we create gods in our lives out of people. We create gods in our lives out of things. We create gods out of the things that are happening to us. Sometimes we allow that our body is breaking down to become a God, a little G God in our lives where we bow down to it and we allow it to rule our being. We allow it to continue to, to prevent us from moving forward. We allow things in our lives to become gods, a little G God, not a capital G. Not God the creator, but God, a little g. Do you have anything in your life that you struggle with that has become a little g God? Whether it be work, whether it be a house, a car, whether it be the goal of making all the money that you can, whether it be the body that continues to break down, whether it be whatever it be. Sometimes, or more often than not, we bow down to fear because we're afraid of taking that next step. And we allow fear to become a little G, God, that we bow down to. How sad it is and how difficult it is to hear but we all create little gods in our lives. Sometimes we recognize it. Sometimes we know, and we know that we have to eliminate this. But sometimes we've created an altar within us and we don't even realize it. Sometimes we've created something that has become a little g God in our life, and we don't even recognize it. So my prayer for us today is that we are able to recognize and to see what it is that is becoming a God in our life. Because the work needs to get done. We come here every day because, or every Sunday because we know that something needs to be done. For many of us in our lives, we need to reboot, to restart our systems, to take those things of old that continue to weigh us down and put them aside, to recognize the gods in our life, the Baals that are preventing us from seeing God, God the Creator, capital G God, in our life. It's time that we take those little G gods and move them aside. Elisha knew how much work he still had to do, but he was willing to do it. He was willing to take the mantle. He was willing to continue the work because the people of God needed it, because God was calling him to complete it, because God had called him to be who God had called him to be. So in our lives, as we move into this week, as we move in towards tomorrow, I want us to think about what are the gods in our life? Who might be a god in our life? Where might we have a god that we've built an altar to without recognizing or not intentionally? Because more often than not, we didn't intentionally build it. It was something that progressed over time. When I ask you, is there a God in Israel? When I ask you, is there a God in your life? Will you say there is a God, a capital G God creator in your life? A capital S savior who died on the cross? A capital S spirit? that is poured out upon you. My prayer 
And my hope is that this week, we begin the process of eliminating those altars of little G gods. My prayer is that God would pour the spirit upon each and every one here and that God would break them down and allow us to see that the holy of holies, the altar, the grandest altar of all lives within us. The grandest altar lives within our hearts where the spirit of the Lord ab abides, where the spirit of the redeemer who died lives within us where we don't need any other God because God, the creator, God, the capital G God, has done it all and has inspired us. So may this day, may we pick up the mantle and do the work that God, the creator, is calling us to do. And may this week be the start of the breaking down of altars and the building up of the spirit of the Lord within us. Amen.